Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron. This is Scott. And today we're talking about how Israel wanted a king. All right. So I started an intro. If there's a little bit of a pause, I started to say how we want a king, but I was basically looking at it from the perspective of Israel, right? So we're going to talk about how Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 8 said, give us a king like all the nations around us, right? And I have two quotes I want to start out with. Um, in 1948, there was a guy named Winston Churchill, who you may know who he is. Never if, heard of him. No? <laughs> Winston Churchill? Yeah, I'm just kidding. Winston Congregation Mountain? I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, well. I didn't that was, that that was that not one. a good one. Yeah. Um, just... <laughs> This is the judge. It's like the called jury, out hill. Jury, strike that one. Okay. So um, pretend I didn't say that. Yeah. Uh, in 1948, he gave a speech to the British House at Washington's laughing over there. So it makes, uh, it, it, makes it more authentic, right? That's right. <laughs> you that's get right. The bad jokes I'm like, too. Sh- should we start over? And I'm like, no, no, no. No, uh, we're just going to keep going. So in 1948, he gave a speech to the British House of Commons and he said something that's very famous. Yeah. Those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And of course, when you look up the origin of that quote, there's always people that are like, someone else said it first. He didn't originate it. So and it says in 1905, a man named George Santayana, in his work, The Life of Reason, he said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But the sentiment is really the same thing. Basically, learn from history or you're going to repeat it. You're doomed to repeat it. Learn from the past and remember it or you're condemned to repeat it. But guess what? Someone had that idea before they did. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's been around for a long time. Yeah, I'm assuming people have been saying that since the dawn of time, but at least in the scriptures, you have it recorded a few times. In Romans yeah. 15, you got, read Romans 15 yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, I'll read it. Um, it says, for it. whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. That's what you're reading as fast as I am. I read it, but yeah, I do know that one. Yeah, whatever things were written before time or afore time were written for our learning. First Corinthians 10, 6 says, now things these things that, are written become our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Yeah, it, it has some examples previously. And then it says they are examples to us. So you don't lust after things like they did, right? And in fact, in Luke 17, uh, 26 through 32, it's talking about judgment. And it says, remember Noah and the ark. That's a summary. And then it says, remember Lot's wife. And so all those examples, including those two quotes, are basically saying things, at least in the New Testament ones, that the Old Testament examples, while they're not binding on me, they are set forth as reminders of God's principles. Like yeah. while Numbers 35, the guy picks up sticks and gets stoned for it, right? That doesn't apply to me because I'm not a Jew living under the law of Moses and I don't have the Sabbath regulation, which Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5 says was given to who? The nation of Israel, not the people before him, not the people after him, but the nation of Israel, right? And so while they're not binding on us, they really remind us about God's nature, his character, and how we're supposed to respond to God, right? And so just like Winston Churchill, George Santayana, Paul, um, Jesus, we got to learn from things in the past so we don't repeat those same things, right? And so with those thoughts in mind, I want to look at an Old Testament story, uh, account. I said story like in season one, and someone's like, it's not a story, it's an account. I'm like, I've you th- obviously, I'm on a podcast called The Authentic Christian, teaching about why you should believe the inspiration well, of the well, Bible. Uh, if I call it a story, I still believe that it actually happened, okay? I mean, look, you man, know. like the, the opening line of what Fresh Prince starts, this is the story. Like, everybody knows. Like, we're, yeah. it's all right, man. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. We believe the Bible is inspired. God breathes, yes. right? So, it's an account. Yes. And does it count? Not if I say story, I mean, we it don't really mean, actually happened. Okay? Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're going to be in 1 Samuel 8, but let's give some background, right? So the things leading up, I started to say, I'm not going to give you the whole summary from the beginning, but I will. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books. Genesis, the world's created. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They sin. Their descendants lead down to Noah. The world's become so corrupt. God floods the the earth and eight souls are saved through water, 1 Peter 3.20. Um, And then you have the descendants down to Abraham. Abraham's descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. The people of Israel, his descendants, because of Joseph, his son, they end up where? In Egypt. They're in bondage. They come out, and they're being led by Moses. And then Moses dies, and Joshua takes over. Okay, He's like the protege of Moses. So Joshua, they start to, uh, they have the conquest of the land, right, of the land of Canaan, where they cross the Jordan. Well, then you have the book of Judges, and you have the book of Ruth, which are the ones that precede the book we'll be in today. So Ruth comes between Judges and 1 Samuel, but Ruth is a story that likely takes place early on in the period of the judges. And the reason I would say that is because in Matthew 1, 5, it says, it gives the genealogy of Jesus. And it says that uh, Boaz, who's the main character in 
one of, well, not the main character, one of the main characters in the book of Ruth. He's one that marries Ruth. Um, his mom was Rahab, who was from Jericho, which is when they con the very beginning of the conquest. So, you know, if you want like an actual chronology, when you lead from judges, like right into, into first Samuel, this is that first or second generation. Yes. Yes. Right after. Yes. So when you look at the book of judges, which leads up to the book of first Samuel, it was really a dark time. Like in judges 19, there's a really horrific story about a concubine cut up into 12 pieces and sent to all the nation, the different tribes and said, if you don't show up, this is what we're going to do to you. Right. And you say like, how did they get to such a, awful dark i mean the book of judges is one of and the quickly. worst period very quickly right yeah, that's what i'm saying i think uh does it begin the book of judges talking yes. about how they departed almost immediately it does actually go to there go to judges two while you're going to judges yeah. two you know this you you say that exact question you just said how they get yeah. there so quickly deuteronomy 6 and deuteronomy 11 and many other places they gave the israelites instructions on how to make sure their children followed god and stayed faithful deuteronomy 11 18 through 19 says this Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, bind them as a sign on your hand and frontlets between your eyes, not literally, but you know, um, you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. That's kind of your whole day. If you think about it, like this morning, I was lying down, open my eyes. I actually had a really bad cramp in my calf, if I'm honest with you. I like woke up from that and I'm like, ah, I, it was horrible. It's my right leg. So that's how I woke up. So um, that's not a fun I, way. Yeah, no, not a fun way. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. So I get out of bed and um, it says when you rise up, which I did very quickly, when you're in your house, okay, um, when you walk by the way, so when you leave your house, and then of course, at some point in your day, like I'll go home later and I'll do what? I'll go from walking in the way to back into sitting in my house, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'll lie down. Literally all four, the, this is your whole day. When, you, when you're in your house, when you wake up, when you lie down to go to sleep, and in between that, when you're inside your house and outside your house. Mm -hmm. And it says you're supposed to teach your children, right? And unfortunately, it says later in Deuteronomy 6 and 11, if you don't do that. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Sure. Um, but maybe. if, yeah, yeah, I mean, oh, maybe the New Testament. Oh, I thought you were this? saying that's in Deuteronomy 6 No, I'm or just 11. thinking like maybe like, that's, think that's uh, maybe right, that's kind of related here. Okay, know. sure. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I thought you were saying that was in Deuteronomy 6 no, and 11. I'm like, in my, I don't sorry. think that's in there, but I, yeah. So in those texts, it also says, if you don't, um, if you don't teach your children, they'll forget, right? So you you go to Judges 2, read 7 through 12. Okay. Judges 2, 7 through 12. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done before Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the, the Baals. I don't know how you prefer to pronounce that, but the Baals, Baals uh, and they, the, the other false idols and stuff. Anyway, they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them and they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. Yeah, so that's great. Thank you for reading that. Basically, the next generation didn't follow God. And it's Joshua and that generation, once they all died, the next generation didn't follow God. Well, why not? I'm assuming they weren't taught. I mean, how it's, it doesn't even say, let me see, who did not, verse 10, when all that generation was gathered to the fathers, Joshua and the older I, I assume they didn't do enough good job, you know? Well, yeah, it says another generation arose who did not know the Lord nor the work he had done for Israel. Yeah. How, how, how do you not know? I know. You weren't taught. If your parents did what they were told to do. How could this have happened? Yep. And we're and not talking about they sent them off to school somewhere here. No. They learn at home. You well, know? They didn't learn at home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Or in this case, yeah. they didn't learn at they home. They should have learned They at learned home. everything except this at home. And they didn't. And if you go read Deuteronomy 6, just read the whole chapter. It says, if you teach them, this will happen. If you don't, this is what will happen. Yeah. And they didn't teach them and exactly what God predicted would happen. And so when you read through the book of Judges, it's this cycle, which is they're unfaithful, they're enslaved. Uh, they're in bondage to somebody, a nation, Philistines, whoever, Moab, uh, Midianites, Moabites. They repent, and then finally God will deliver them. And it's over and over. And, you know, Judges 17, 6, uh, and Judges, well, I should have just, Judges 17, 6. Here we go. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Proverbs 12, 15, I have written in my Bible, says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. 
right? And it says, yep. rather, we should be like Asa in Second Chronicles 14, 2 through 4, who did what was right in God's eyes, right? That's just a, that's a note I have in my Bible. So Judges 17, 6, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And in fact, the end of Judges 21, 25 says the exact same thing. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Yeah. And so basically you wonder, how did they get so wicked? Well, they didn't teach the next generation. And so what happened? That generation forsook God, lived for themselves, worshiped the idols like everybody else around them, became just like the world because they did what was right in their own eyes. And I look at the world today and man, I feel like, not to say this meanly, I wonder if we have one of the most biblically, at least in the United States, the most biblically ignorant populace for the United States since its founding a couple hundred years ago. Yeah, I'm not trying to be mean, but I was literally thinking the exact same thing here. Yeah, and because people don't know what the Bible is and so many people don't believe what it says, therefore, that's why we have such a horrible problem with sin in our culture today. It's, it's yeah, really we parallel. We don't give it the time in our day. That's just the truth. That's right. Even people that claim to believe in it don't give it the time in their day. Pull your phones out if you're at home, whatever. Yeah. And open it up. And I guarantee you there's a section in there somewhere. It's like digital well-being or screen time. Mm -hmm. And uh, just go to the last seven days, count how many hours you spent, like, mindlessly yeah. scrolling Facebook or something. Yeah. And I'm not condemning people for looking up. Like, I got Twitter account, man. Yeah. I look at it sometimes when it's night, whatever. I'm chilling. Sure. Kids are asleep. Whatever, man. Sure. That's fine. But I'm saying add it up. And if you got, like, 20 hours a week on something like that, but – uh your Bible app reports like zero or 10, there's your problem. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And go to, we'll go watch our last episode. Just like them and the people today, they got away from God's truth and truth became relative. And they thought, well, I can do whatever I want. You know, you, you get away from, and that's why people don't want to talk about sin and judgment. Don't, man, don't, don't talk to me about that. I don't want to think about that kind of stuff. I just want to live. You can think about it if you want to, but I want to live my life however I want to. Yeah. And so how do you get to first Samuel eight? That's sort of the background of the people. Um, in 1 Samuel, it starts in the first few chapters about uh, Elkanah, who's Samuel's dad, and Hannah. And it talks about the story of his conception where Hannah couldn't have children. She prayed to God, said, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. God blessed her with a child. She gave, as soon as he was weaned, she gave Samuel to Eli. Um, I have 1 Samuel 2, 18, 19, the cutest for the moms watching. It says, Samuel's mother would come up each year to offer the yearly sacrifice, and she would bring him a little robe that she made for him each year as he grew. So I don't know how old he was. I think like his little four-year-old Samuel. His mom brings him this like cute little robe. I got little boys now, so I think it's, you know, if you just said to me five years ago, I'd be like, okay, it's, I don't like that verse as much. But The yearly sacrifice. Yearly sacrifice. So every year she goes up and makes him this new little robe, right? Yeah. First Samuel 2.26 says, and the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor with both the Lord and men. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Luke 2.52 said Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with both the Lord and men. Yep. Right? So anyway, and then finally you have this in 1 Samuel 6. The ark is captured. They take it into battle. They think, well, if we just have the ark, even if we're unfaithful, we'll win. They take the ark. The Philistines take the ark of the covenant. They go to their cities, and that doesn't go well for them. So they send it back. And uh, in 1 Samuel 7, 15, look at this. 1 Samuel 7, 15. You got that? I can. You're yeah. an eight. Read 1 Samuel what? Uh, read First Samuel seven. Well, if you're already at chapter eight, you just got to scroll up. First Samuel seven fifteen. All right. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Okay, and things were well. It says in the preceding verses that after the ark came back, some of the people died. They repented, and they back. They basically got became faithful to God again, and they had taken back some of the cities from uh, Gath and Ekron, which were two of the Philistine cities. And so things were, there was peace between Israel and the Amorites, verse 14 says, and Samuel judged Israel. Verse 16, he went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and judged Israel. There he judged Israel and built an altar to the Lord, verse 17. So things are going well. They're finally faithful to God again. Samuel is judging them. And then you have uh, chapter 8. And I want to read, actually, the whole chapter. So, you know, God decided to give us the Bible the way he did with accounts, <laughs> stories, and so we're going to read it. We're just going to read 1 Samuel chapter 8. Scott, you're a very good reader. So uh, you just want to read 1 Samuel chapter 8. I can. Verse 1, all the way through the end of the chapter. I can do it. <clears throat> if, you got, now, and if you're at home, grab your Bibles. That's it. That's it. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judge, judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the, second, uh, the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. 
But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties and will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take of your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to his city. All right. Thank you. So when you look at this account, you know, we know about King Saul who comes first in chapter nine, talks about his story starts. We know about King David. We know about Solomon. Um, you might know about the fact that after Solomon, the kingdom's divided, and you have Jeroboam in the north and Rehoboam in the south, uh, Rehoboam being the son of Solomon. And then you have basically the divided kingdom of Israel until uh, the time where Assyria destroys the northern kingdom and Babylon destroys the southern kingdom. And then they come back after captivity, and they don't have, a, they don't have another king. Uh, but they're waiting for a king like David. They're waiting for Jesus. He doesn't turn out to be the king that they, the type of king they wanted. But... This is the whole, like, this is the crux of how this idea of Israel having a king starts. And there's three, there's three points I have to talk about, lessons we can learn from it, because if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? The first right. one is how important leadership is. Um, you can see in many of the accounts, we looked at the beginning of Judges. Uh, we looked at um, the beginning of 1 Samuel 8. The first domino that fell in 1 Samuel 8, um, and you can see what it led to, was that... Um, how much people can be affected by the direction of the leadership uh, in a congregation, in a people, right? And so in 1 Samuel 8, you look and you see the exact same thing that happened in Judges 2, right? Joshua and the faithful generation died, and they didn't do what? Oh, they didn't pass the knowledge down. They didn't train the next generation. They didn't mm -hmm. teach the next generation. And look what happened. They went from faithfully following God to then what? Going and following after all the idols of the world around them. Yeah, they were trying to follow the other people, that's the right. world, the that's other, right. they, they look to humans instead. That's right. And you have Samuel and his sons were not what? They weren't faithful. Now, I don't nope. know whether Samuel tried to restrain them and they were just rebellious. I don't know if Samuel, I don't know. I assume I'm not that he would have done more than his predecessor, Eli, who was yeah. condemned for not restraining That's right. You're sons. right. It doesn't, Eli says he, his sons were ungodly and he didn't restrain them. Yeah, that's right. Samuel it doesn't say that about Samuel. So we don't yeah. know. But either way, the, whatever happened, the first domino that fell is that they didn't have leadership. Mm -hmm. And so the first lesson I think we can learn from it is we always need to be thinking about the next generation. So if those of you who are watching are um, elders or preachers or deacons or just fathers, you know, and mothers, just whoever, yeah, whoever, all Christians, God, you know, we have a responsibility to train 
the people who the next generation, you know, identify future yes. people. I mean, it should be teaching all people, right? But like, for instance, leadership of a local congregation is el- is elders. Yes, elders should be looking for younger men, um, and saying, "Hey, this guy would be a good elder." And shepherding them. That's right. This guy could be a good elder in five to ten years. Or having a class where you say, "This is what all young men should be aspiring to." I really think that. Amen. If if you're a young Christian man watching this, um, let's say you're 15 or 16, you should aspire one day to to serve God in the best of your ability. That might be as an elder. Yeah. Well, if you read First Timothy three and say, "Hey, to be an elder, I have to have a wife who's hospitable and faithful, etc." That should be something you keep in mind when you're looking at who to date and who to marry, right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. at the very least, you should aspire to be ready and willing, if you're needed, to be the kind of man who, if you're called upon and there's a need, you're able to fill that role and able to help, yeah. right? Yeah. You're talking about the idea of aspiring, I think, yeah. ultimately, yeah. to being someone who can meet the qualifications of an elder, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to cut to the plain statement here, that's, that's what ultimately, if you're that kind of man, that yeah. God has set aside as a special class and he's had all these qualifications. If you can yeah. aspire to be that, even if you don't end up being that, yeah. if you're qualified to be that, that's what we need to be. Yeah. Because and, you might need to be that man. And first Timothy might need First Timothy three, I think first Timothy three is what every Christian should aspire, like you're saying. Every yeah. Christian should want to be the guy in First Timothy three. Whether you ever end up serving as an elder or not, yes. it's still you look at first Timothy three and those qualifications it gives you. That's the gold standard. It's for what you a for, mature yeah. Christian should be. Yeah. yeah. And so you can start looking at that as, hey, this is what I want. This is my checklist, you know? Yeah. And I guess you could say Jesus is really the gold standard, but you know what I mean. Well, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah. 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 I mean, so yeah, you want to be, you want to imitate Jesus. And yeah. if you look at first Timothy three, Jesus had all those characteristics, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, so the other thing too, about with your leadership is support your leadership. Um, you know, there's a lot of things over the years I've learned that church leadership deals with behind closed doors. You'll never hear about. Um, I, we have a book in our lobby. That's actually where the first time I read it, it's called it's Glenn Colley's book awake at night. And uh, it was basically at, at PTP every year. I've, uh, yeah, I've talked through some of that book at okay. Edgewood, I think. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So it's a book where he basically just changes names and locations and yeah. all the details of stories. But he talks about different stories that are actual real stories eldership's yes. have dealt it's with. It's a great book. And it's eye-opening that you realize. Very pragmatic book. Sure, especially you. if you're an elder. But yeah. it also just helps you as a non-elder to appreciate elders and the kind of things that That's what I was going to say. We did it with the congregation and I yeah. found it to be very useful in that way because it helps you. I think that I think one of the things generally I think we need to work on is, mm-hmm. is being a more empathetic people. And I think sure. it helps us to do that. Sure. I think sure. it helps us to understand what that is like. And when we are, when there's more transparency like that, I think mm-hmm. that people are, are more willing to bear with you as first yeah. Corinthians 13 says, or, yeah. or to be patient and things like that. Yeah. You know, it helps to build that relationship. I agree. That's great. So that's so the first point. Summarize the first point, and that is, remember how important leadership is, and train the next generation. Yes. Do what? Go read Deuteronomy six and Deuteronomy eleven. Um, study your New Testament. You know, older women teach the younger women, right? Is that Titus three, two, three. Yeah. It's in two or three. Well, you know um, what? You know what? It Cha- is in chapters. Titus if you're talking about the older teaching the younger. If you're thinking about the specific section about wives, I think that's in Timothy, and that's the deacon. No, wives. yeah, I know that. Yeah, okay, that's that'll be that'll be First Timothy three. Yeah. I'm talking about. Older women teach younger. It's either Titus two or three, but guess what? Chapters were added by man. So yeah. Washington says it's Titus two. So well, I was just okay. say it's in Titus. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Well, yeah. you know, chapters and verse were added I'm just by speak man. Where the so Bible's teach, Titus, you know. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so, but anyway, so that was the first problem: is they didn't train the next generation, right. and the leadership suffered. And then the people said, "You know what? We want to." And this is the second point: they wanted to be like everybody around them. And the second point I have is stop trying to fit in. Christians, yeah. stop trying to fit in. That was Israel's biggest problem. Israel said, you know, we want to be like everybody around us. They, we want a king. I mean, that, what does that mean? They wanted a human king. Who do they have as their king? Who did they have? Starts with G. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, he was their yeah. He was their king. Yeah. We want a king like the nations around us. Well, what about God? Yeah, we don't want him as our king. You have Yahweh as your king the creator of the, of the universe and you want, yeah, you know, we want, we want, we want a human King. It reminds me of, I, so Gideon, he was in the judges. Gideon. But that, that's a good point. That brings us back to where we started, right? That's because yeah. we have to teach that next generation. They, they, they didn't appreciate who they had at yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Well, you know, so Gideon had his faults, right? He wasn't perfect. Yeah. But in judges eight, go to judges eight, go to judges eight, 22. Mm-hmm. And I want to have you read two verses, judges eight, 22 and 23. So, okay. 
we need what they needed and we do today. We need to keep this in mind. We need Gideon's attitude, right? So Gideon is yeah. in the judges and he defeats the Midianites. And listen to what they say after Gideon defeats the Midianites. Read 8, uh, 8, 22 and 23. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor my son, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So they say to Gideon, Hey, we want you and your son and your grandson. We want a monarch. Gideon had the right answer. Yeah. We want you. He says, You delivered us from the hand of Midian. Mm -hmm. It's like, Where were you? Gideon's like, I didn't deliver you. Who delivered you? What what process did he have to go through to get his army? Yeah. It's almost like God knew something, didn't he? God knew something. <laughs> God's like, you, you have know. what? I don't know, 20, 30,000 men. And God's yeah. like, slim it down to 300, the, mm -hmm. real, the real original story yeah. of the 300. And they say, you delivered us, Gideon. I wonder if I that was for the it. people or for Gideon. I don't know. But. I don't know. But either way, after it happens, what happens? They say, hey, Gideon, we want you to be our king. We want to set up a monarchy with you, your son, and your grandson. And Gideon says, no, I didn't save you. God saved you. He's your king. Amen. The Lord's going to rule over you. He, he recognized the big picture here. Yeah. And you know, so you see that in 1 Samuel 8, that's not the first time they wanted a king, right? But in 1 Samuel 8, they cared too much about what the people around them were doing. They didn't, mm -hmm. you know, God said that they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, right? They were supposed to be an example to the Gentiles. And the Gent, I mean, they're supposed to be a light to the nations. How did their first king go awry? Well, you tell me. Saul, what did he do? He listened to the people. He blamed the people, he most blamed certainly. The people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, the people, they wanted to do this. That's why you hear the bleeding of the sheep and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these people here, they have God as their king, and they don't care. They don't want to be God's special people. They they don't want to be a light to the nations. They don't want to be the people whose God drowned the Egyptians, probably yeah. the world's biggest power at that time. God conquers them. That's who they, that's who, the, when they went to Jericho, Rahab said, hey, we heard of you and your God. He, killed, he took care of the Egyptians. And they said, yeah, we don't want to be. <laughs> special. We want to be less special. We want to be like everybody else around us. They were worried with, I put it to you later. I think this is a part of it. And, and I don't know how to relate this best, but, but to give a personal example for me, what helps me to make it through when I like sitting in front of cameras, doesn't really bother me that much. But when I stand in front of people, I get like really nervous. It makes my stomach upset. So a no, lot of stuff. no, no live audience. Other <laughs> I don't Washington. mind it. I've gotten over it. Like in a sense, I learned to push through it, but that's the Good. point. What helps me push through it is before I walk up, I might give some of Bobby Liddell's advice, grip the seat, take a breath. But then I remember um, my audience is, is a, you want to use a direction above me, uh, not literally, yeah. not in front of me. Yeah. I'm, I'm worried about pleasing the Lord. Yeah. Not pleasing the people around me. And every time we see this, yeah. it seems like they're more interested in the status that comes with, we want a king like them. We want to be like them. We want to look like them. Yeah. But we want it fancier. We want this. We want to, you know, yeah. that's what people are interested in yeah. when they take their eyes off of the Lord. I when heard, you remember that he's the one you should be pleasing. That's right. Jason Rollo said, you don't get in that he, Jason Rollo said to me, I did a, little like a, on a lectureship, he was there and we were talking and got to spend some time. And he said something at some point, he said that when a, when a man gets in the pulpit, he doesn't have any friends. And Amen. What, what he meant is when I you think get, I know what he means. Yeah. He means when you get in the pulpit to preach, you don't have friends. You're well, let me finish then. You yep. can, yes. He says, you don't worry about what the people in front of you are going to think about your lesson. All yes. you're worried about, he said, he either said a man doesn't have any friends or the only friend he has is God. There you go. Meaning, I'd say I'd modify it just one. Yeah. Man's got one friend that yeah. he's worried about. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, that's, so but I know whichever he way he told me, that's what Jason said is when you get in the pulpit, the only person you should be concerned about is pleasing God. Yes. And yes. it's like the Old Testament prophets, man, they, they didn't, Jeremiah. <laughs> You don't you work. Know, Micah, Amos, man, they didn't care. People. That's right. You, you don't work, work for them. the Lord. You work for the Lord. That's right. And so basically they were so concerned about the people around them. They didn't want to be special. They didn't want to be God's special people. They want to be just like everybody else. And so the application for today is, can we fall into that trap today? Oh, it all we do all yeah, the, the time. church does all the time. I mean, there's been times where I know that I have been worried too much more about what other people are going to think or what other people are going to say. I know we fall into it because I've mm -hmm. fallen into it. Mm -hmm. I've had to repent of it. Yeah. I mean, look, man, that's yeah. the truth. It's easy. This is an easy temptation. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking very negatively of it, but I'm not trying to pretend like I'm above it. Yeah. This is a very easy temptation to fall into, to just become more concerned with what other people think, yep. other people want, yep. what is comfortable for me, maybe even what I want. And all of that starts to happen yeah. when you forget your place, That's who right. you are created to serve. You That's were right. fearfully and wonderfully made, made in the image of God. We're here to serve the Lord. That's we're right. here to glorify him. Yeah. We keep our eyes on him. Mm -hmm. 
we keep our hearts on doing what he told us to do, mm-hmm. this won't be a problem, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway. You're right. I mean, I think I think about how we can fall into this today. And, you know, you whether it's an individual level, whether it's you look at the world and you say, well, you know, the world's compromising on these moral issues. I don't really want to be one that f- offends people. So maybe I should just cave on it. No. You, you don't want to be like the world if you're a Christian. You want to be like Christ. It's so easy. To be you want to stand out. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, you're supposed to be a light on a hill, right? Amen. In 2 Corinthians 1 or 2. And if the salt has lost its savor, we're that's with right. you. I mean, it's worthless. Yeah. Trampled underfoot. That's yeah. right. And so you're supposed to be a salt and light. And the darker the world gets, the brighter you are if you actually are being a light. We, as individuals, don't cave to the world. Study we're your about Bible. to come back to the fig tree again. That's right. <laughs> you know? That's right. That's where we're at. And when it comes to congregations or, you know, speaking specifically to the to the Lord's church now, don't look down the street on your way to services and see a packed parking lot and think, you know what, maybe we should just do what they do. You know, well, when I get home, we're going to look on their Facebook. Oh, they got a band. Oh, they got, they got, they got, you know, all kinds of different, they got light shows and all sure. that. Sure. Don't try to imitate. Look, if they're doing something that's not unscriptural, you can imitate that as long yeah. as there's nothing wrong with we're it. We're not saying like intentionally have an old, ugly, dated facility because you don't want to look like the modern building but we're but you, you, the point isn't about the paint it's about what are they doing are they concerned with doing what the lord says to do and is that what's drawing people or what exactly are they concerned with looking like the things that they see going on around them in the world yeah don't compromise the you know, truth and don't compromise doctrine and don't compromise the assembly that the lord wants and the worship he wants Yes. Because you want to be like the nations around us. Yes. Numbers are not bad if you're getting them the right way, but you can't, you don't want to compromise the gospel for Amen. numbers. And too many churches do that. They're like, you know, we're a seeker friendly church. And so they compromise the gospel so they can get big numbers. Some simply choose to not preach on things. They don't go out of yeah. their way to say certain things, yeah. but they just refuse to deal with certain issues. That could be a way as well that we sure. can compromise. Well, and if you love the people that you're preaching to and there's an issue that is in your local congregation, you but you got to preach on it. Yes. If you love the youth, if you love the institution of marriage, tell your young people about what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Yes. If you teach your youth about marriage, divorce, remarriage, you should never have any issues. At least you, you'll never have an issue where they say, well, I didn't know, right? Yeah, you'll never have an issue where they are in a situation dissimilar to what we are after having received Second Peter. We've received the scriptures. We've given the warning. You've taught them the thing. Now they've grown up. It's their choice to obey it or not. Yeah, We're going to yeah. urge them all day. Sure. But you got to make sure you give them the proper tools. And uh, yeah. beyond that, you know, keep, keep encouraging. Keep Romans 12, 2 has got this idea. Do not be conformed to this world, yes. but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Stop trying to fit in. Yes. There's too many young people. We're peculiar people. We are. You know, it's okay if you're weird. If if you're if they think you're weird or they think, man, this guy, you know, 1 Peter 3 says when you become a Christian, your friends look at you. Is it, yeah, 1 Peter 3, yeah. They look at you and they say, man, you don't do all the and same stuff you used to. They think it's strange that you don't run to riot. That's them. right. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, and it, I mean, I, yeah. yeah. Don't be afraid to stand out. Yeah. You know, we... There's too much, you know, peer pressure. Yeah, I get it. In what sense does God make known his wisdom and then the world calls it foolishness and you are mm-hmm. surprised by that, right? Mm-hmm. That's another one that can tell you, look, we know that. Yeah. Um, what we do, what we say will be contrary to what people outside in the world do and say. Yeah. I mean, it's going to look very different. It's going to sound strange to them. Yeah. And it might, and, it, and it's not going to fit in. That's okay. I agree. We're not supposed to. That's right. And these people, that's all they wanted to do. Yeah. You know, we had a set of visitors um, at South Haven uh, a while back, and I did something I, kind of different than what I, I'd been thinking about it for a long time. Like, why don't I do this more? But anyway, they, you know, I asked them, you guys visiting? And they said, yeah. And uh, I said, you know, what brought you here? And they said, well, we're trying to find God. And I said, can I be honest with you? And they said, yeah. I said, if you all are looking for a church to entertain you, if you want a church that just gives you the feel goods in an emotional way and you can just go home, then, and you just want to be entertained. I said, we're not the church for you. And I said, now, if you want to glorify God and you want to learn what the Bible says and what God wants from us and how to transform our lives and you want to follow him and glorify him and not yourselves, 
then this is a spot for you. Yeah. And I said, we, our church is on church road. I said, you can go up and down this road and you can find churches that'll entertain you. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I'm happy to discuss any of them with you. I said, but if you want to learn more about God and glorify him, then this is the place you need to be. It was almost like I was trying to talk him out of it. Like, not in a sense. I wasn't saying, hey, we don't like you here, but I was saying- You're trying to get them to count the cost. Yeah, I'm trying to say, if you want entertainment, go somewhere else. I'm, yeah. I'm on a Facebook group for a different city, um, and I see people all the time. Hey, I want a church that has a great band. I want a church that entertains. I want a church that has this and that. And you know what none of them ever say? I want a church, well, maybe one or two of them do, but they say, I want a church that teaches me how to glorify God. That's what I want a church that makes me a holy person. Yes, that that improves my moral living. I want a church that, that corrects me when I'm wrong or or, yeah. or judges my fruits. Nobody says that. Yeah. And you know that that couple they've been there like I mean almost every single week. I mean, he challenged them for in a good then. way, right? And I, mean, I was just honest with them. And maybe that's what they were looking for, right? And it seems so. And if they weren't, they'd have figured it out real quick. Absolutely. You know, cuz I even said I even said, "Hey, if you're looking for a church that entertains you has the best band, you can see we don't have one on stage. Yeah. We're here about learning about God yeah, and his man. word." And they've been consistent. And so, there's nothing wrong with that at yeah. all. It wasn't rude. You were just No, no, I was them, nice and in the were, way I yeah, said it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So don't try to fit in. Yes. Don't or, don't be worried about fitting in with the world if it means comp compromising on God's standards. Yeah. I'm not trying to say that if the world, you know, wears jeans and a t-shirt, you can't wear jeans and a t-shirt. God didn't you say, know? be ye easy to get along with. He said, be ye holy for I am holy, right? He we also said, concern ourselves as much it. as it's possible to get well, along Well, that's with true. Us. <laughs> hey, you got me there. You got me there. That's right. But I got your point. In as much right. as it is. But be that, holy. That's yes. the thing. In as much as you can be. He and didn't that's say, true. He I didn't need say, to temper the way I said that. Well, he didn't say, be ye popular. That's true because yeah, Jesus. And the point I was trying to make was that, of really. Course, I know. Is I'm giving you a hard time. Put holiness first. Yep. If you can find any way to get along with people, mm -hmm. put that right there because mm -hmm. we're supposed to be a peaceable people. Agreed. Holiness includes peaceableness. Sure. Holiness includes gentleness. Mm -hmm. It includes all of those things. Yeah, I agree. Make that your primary concern. The mm -hmm. rest will fall in place. Mm -hmm. That's right. I agree. Right. So don't try, don't be so concerned about fitting in just for the sake of fitting in. Right. Um, we've said this many times before. Jesus was the perfect preacher and they crucified him. You cannot, there's certain things you cannot word it perfectly to make everybody like you. Luke 6, 26 says, woe to you when all men speak good of you for so their fathers did to, of the prophet, false prophets. Yeah. That's great. If I know. Ever, yeah. What are we, who are we supposed to try to be like? Christ. Who is he? Son of God. Do we see his character throughout the Bible? Yeah. Should we harmonize all that together? Yeah. Should we try to be like that? Yeah. What was Christ? If we think about what would Christ, you know, that's where the question, what would Jesus do? Yeah. That's essentially what it's about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you want to do what's right in front of the Lord, try to be like Christ. And if you're asking yourself the question, what would the Lord do in this tough spot? Mm hmm Whatever it may be, mm -hmm. if it's confrontation or something, then you know that's going to innately include gentleness and peaceableness. So if sure. you focus on being like Him, no matter what it is, whether it's easy, whether it's hard, whether you're in one of the nice peace part of life or you're in one of the downward slopes of the roller coaster of life, yeah, if you focus on that, you'll be okay. Yeah, because He's handles it right. I agree. He's been through all those situations. I you agree. see how he handles it. And when I think about social so. media, you know, it's a big part of people's lives. I think, okay, would Jesus post this? Would Paul post this? Yeah, man. Would Paul like this post? People see what you like. I'm telling you, man. We're supposed to be informed by our conscience, which is trained by the scriptures. So use it. Sure. Right? I get on Facebook and see photos and I see like people that I know that click like on that photo. I'm like, yeah. buddy, you should not be clicking like on that. Yes. Right. Um, you know, it's the music you listen to, you know, I mean, the things you share, like, the stuff you write in your comments under your photos sometimes. Your, as well your captions, man. right, Washington? We see stuff and we're like, Christians should not be saying that. People see it. And don't try to say things that are cool just to fit in, right? You want to be morally pure, godly. And you're going to, I got failings. I'm not this guy on a, oh, I got my whole life figured out. And I got problems. Yeah, right? I do too. But we're trying to work on them, right? So third point, be careful what you wish for, yes. right? Uh, God might just give you what you ask for, right? First uh, Samuel 8, 6, right? The people asked for a king. It says, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Now, when Samuel prays to the Lord, first of all, he's probably disappointed and displeased because he spent his whole life serving. He's been their judge and the people obviously aren't what? They're not happy with it, mm -hmm. right? So he's thinking, did I not do it right? I mean, we subdued the Philistines. I thought things were going well. And I have to imagine when he prays to God, he's thinking God's going to say what? 
The people want a king. And He's Samuel's thinking like, God's going to say, uh, no? Yeah. I would think that Samuel is thinking, yeah, God's not going to give him a king, right? And so the people pray for a king, and the Lord says, yeah, heed the, heed the voice of the people and all that they say. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Wait, what? God yeah. says they pray for a king, which is bad for them, and God says, yes. And so God says, yeah, it's going to be bad for them, I know, but let them have it. So what's the application? And the application for me is, uh, I can think back in my life and I have realized sometimes the things that I've prayed for, um, God not answering it by God saying no is sometimes one of the greatest acts of grace and mercy in my life is prayers that I prayed to God and God said, uh, no. I mean, can you think of times in your life you pray for things and God said no and looking yeah, back, you're I like, have definitely. And uh, one of the things I just include in my prayers now at the end is, uh, but just uh, what, you know, your will be done. Yes. Right. And that's the idea. Yep. I encapsulate every single time. God, I'm asking for this. Yep. But I recognize that you know all things and you always know the right path. So if I'm asking the wrong one or if this is going to hurt me, that's what I mean. Yeah. I want him to choose better for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sometimes you pray a prayer. Maybe you might pray a prayer like this. God, please. Bless us in the things we do right. Defeat us in things we do wrong. Yeah. Like, because you want God's guidance in your yeah. life. Yeah. You want him to decide for you yeah. what is best and what is not best yeah. because he he knows way better than you ever will. Yeah, and there's situations in life, I mean, I can think of a lot that I don't really know at that moment in time what the right decision is. Maybe I'm trying to figure out Desire if Desire God's providence. Yeah. That's if, a good thing. Yeah. And so I'll basically end my prayer with Lord, like, if this is a good thing, like, if it's not, take it away. Or yeah. if it's not, remove that opportunity, right? And so absolutely. That's one side of it, but in the side of here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, have you ever considered the fact that sometimes God answering a request or a prayer might be punishment like at least for these people it was. You know, we talked about Romans 1:24, 26 and 28. Basically God gave these people over to do the things they wanted to do. In 2 Thessalonians 2:10 and 11, if you want to believe a lie, God will let you. And so you need to be careful what you wish for because you might get it. Very and true. so when I think of these people here in 1 Samuel 8, they pray for a king. And then Samuel, in, in verses 10 through 19, God even tells them, God tells Samuel, hey, tell them what this is going to cause. They're going to take your sons, your daughters, your property, your animals, your servants, your land, your food. They're going to take, this king's going to take everything, right? He's like, you understand that you're asking to be oppressed. Yes. Yes, exactly. And then look at what they you, say. You want to be enslaved? Okay. Okay. This is what's going to happen. And then first, <laughs> and they... Then look at 1 Samuel 8, 19 and 20. This is maybe the craziest part to me in the whole verse. 1 Samuel 8, 19 and 20. Nevertheless, after all these warnings, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, no, we'll still have a king over us, that we may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and what? Go out before us and fight our battles. Battles. Against who? <laughs> you want a human king to fight your battles. You want a worldly leader. You don't want God. You don't want Yahweh. Yeah. Fighting your battles for you, yeah, and it's so weird. It, it 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 comes right at what the they had just restored the land, right? They'd they didn't they just take the cities back that was restored to them? They took Ekron and Gath back from the Philistines, right? So they're getting things better. They're on the up and up, and they're like, "But we need the king to go fight battles." Man, for us. I I don't I some I think they just want to fit in. I think they want to be like everybody else, and. I mean, you want a human king to fight your battles, right? You, you, you sports, growing up, I played basketball, yeah. all right? I, it, it, during the summers, I'd go play at the courts all the time. And so when you have games, you pick two captains, yeah. and you get to pick, right? So you pick the best player there, and uh, it was like Vince Veltri or Tyler Dodd or Brandon Brummage, those are the good guys I was buddies with that played. I'll send this to them, maybe they'll watch it. Um, but you'd pick them, and the next guy gets two picks, right? So let's say you got a time machine, and you can pick a general to fight your battle from all of human history, you can pick Alexander the Great, Leonidas of the Sp Spartans, King David, Julius Caesar, Spartacus, Crassus, who put down that revolt we talked about before. Anyone you want. I mean, you can pick any of those. Braveheart, William Wallace, right? Genghis Khan. A lot. You can have, how about you have all those, right? You can have all those on your side and I just get Jesus. <laughs> How about you get every leader <laughs> from history that was ever successful in any way that you can and say all their it. armies. Yes. And I get Jesus. Yeah. And who who you who you put your money on? 
Oh, well, I'm going to go and read uh, uh, Second Peter, maybe, and yeah. put my money on the one who gets to melt everything. Yeah, melt everything. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's like, I'm you just know, saying. you have these, uh, you have like these movies where it's like a, 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 a yeah. battle yeah. and one side is like, they're just defeated and the other side is this giant army and then like their key figure shows up and you're like, oh, it's like, imagine in this battle, you have all the, the armies of the world gathered and then Jesus just shows up. Like, Revelation 19, 11 and following on his white horse yeah, he's with his like, robe nope, dipped nah, in we're blood. Done with this. Y'all are done. It's Bye-bye. like, yeah, just me and Jesus. Like Jesus, yeah. you know, and I'll just, it's Jesus versus the armies of the world, all the human leaders. And I'm like, Jesus, can I just, can I like get a seat and just, just watch this, just sit on my hands and watch Jesus take care of everything. The Lord of hosts, Yahweh Saba, which is the Lord of armies. And the one who Joshua meets before Jericho. And he's like, are you for us and against us? He's like, neither. Said, you know? uh, Yahweh uh, Lord of the hosts, uh, hosts Sa- armies, Sabah, or, Saba. Yeah. 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 Sabaoth, I think. Maybe yeah. Cause it's not, Sa- it's like an extra little, it sounds yeah. different. T-S- it sounds similar, but T-S-A-B-A, which of course is not Hebrew numerals or letters, but uh, that's the transliteration, I think. So Yahweh Saba is what Isaiah 6, 1, uh, Isaiah 6, where it's the pre-incarnate Christ uses that. Uh, Lord of hosts, uh, Joshua five, where um, Joshua before crossing into Jericho, he meets the commander of the armies mm-hmm. of the Lord. And then John 11 says it was Jesus, right? Yeah. So it says that the Isaiah six was Jesus. He saw his glory. You have that. And you say, no, we want a human king to go fight our battles for us. It's like, what's wrong with you? Well, I mean, I don't know what would lead them to believe that. So no, I mean, if you, if it, God told me, Hey man, here's a bunch of land, uh, have fun, just follow the rules, and I'll make sure nobody comes in and pillages you and stuff. Like I'm I'm putting it super, super simple layman terms, right? Yeah. Not trying to be disrespectful. I'm sure. saying if sure. that's the deal, I'll take that. Yeah. You Who think- wants to go to war with anyone? Yeah. For any reason. Yeah. When you get a home, you think so. You with think your that. family. And that's supposed with to with everything you need. And what is what are those old testament stories? They're supposed to be examples for us. It's just so, we're not content, man. Well, yeah. You know? And the other <laughs> thing too is those are pictures those are pictures. I would think that that's like a, a type of if, if, if Egypt is bondage, right? Yeah. Physical bondage and sin is spiritual bondage. And, you know, you have a deliverer that takes you out through water. First Corinthians 10, baptized in Moses in the sea, leads you into the wilderness, which becoming a Christian, you're baptized. And then you're in this on this earth, which is the wilderness. It's not your home. Your home is supposed to be for those people coming out of Egypt, oh, Canaan. Yeah. I see that. And, allegory and, and we're supposed to be the promised land is heaven. Yeah. And you have what? You can have this, you can basically have this promised land to be saved, but you have to do what? You have to expel the things from your life that God says to do by following his commands. As a Christian, you need to expel sin from your life by following yeah. his commands. You and we will faithful. say, and we will say, like you just said, yeah, well, man, why, how dumb were they? Why couldn't they just follow God's commands and they oh, would yeah, win the can. victory and they'd live in the promised land? And then t- people today look at that and they say, yeah, okay. All right, back to my favorite sin. Like, I've been there, you know? Like, it's so easy to just look at these people and say, like, man, how you know you just look down on them and then yeah. you look in your own personal life and you're like wait a minute i i gotta be introspective and that's and true it's really easy to look back and it's not i don't know if you would call it it's not hindsight because we didn't experience it, but it's something like that you know you can look yeah. back and you can have the advantage of having seen and read and yeah. known all the yeah. things and take advantage of learning from their mistakes yeah it's like um, when i read in the old testament about when they murmured against like moses and aaron god says they murmured against them when they murmured against their leaders and i'm like man those people murmuring against Moses, that was the leadership. Man, God, you better punish them. And then I'm like, have, oh, by the way, oh, yeah, okay. Hey, have, can we talk about the elders, how bad the elders are? Mm-hmm. And it's like, you realize that's your leadership. Now, unless they're doing something sinful, okay. Right. But like, murmuring is the same thing. As long as they're being faithful. That's right. Be careful. You know? And I I, I got to keep that in mind too. We have great eldership now. So. Um, so they basically want this king. So the three points, train the next generation. Um, always be thinking about the next generation. If you have kids, teach your kids. Don't expect the Bible class teachers at church, which ours do a great job, but you're spending, I don't know, I'm not doing the Expect them to be your help, the They're cherry helping. on top, but how not much the cake. Yeah, but you have so much more time with your kids. Exactly. Than That's your Bible point. class teacher. Yeah. yeah, you teach your kids. It's Whose responsibility is it to teach your kids? Me. You and your wife. Whose responsibility is to teach my kids? Me and my wife. Now, the Bible class teachers, the preacher, the, the it's great. That's but that's I'm, like, like, yeah, you, yeah, that's, yeah that's like, what I meant. That's yeah, right. Like, they're the little cherry on top. They're the little nice thing extra you get as a little help for a couple of hours a week. That's right. With your job. That's right. It's like, <laughs> if, it's like if you go to you church know? on Wednesday night and your teacher gives them like a pack of goldfish, right? Yeah. And you don't feed them the rest of the week. And then you're like, 
Well, hey, my kids. I took them to church. Why'd they starve to death? Yeah, why'd they starve to death? Well, because it's your job to feed them. Yeah, man. And when your kids wake up in the morning, it's your job to feed them. Yeah. You don't wait till Sunday and Wednesday for your kid to get physical food. So why would you do the same thing spiritually, which is much more important, right? So train the next generation. Um, train your children. Train those around you at your congregation. Secondly, don't try to fit in with the world just because you want to fit in. Be Try to be like God. Be a light on a hill, right? Stick out if you're doing it for the right reasons, okay? Thirdly, be careful what you wish for. Be uh, careful Be careful yes. what you pray for because yes. you just might get My it. My mind went blank. Right? Yeah. So they wish for a king, and God gave it to them, and it was not good for them. In fact, over the next well, thousand years, no king they ever had fulfilled what God provided as a king. When God was their king, they had it, they had it good if they were faithful to him. They want an earthly king. It never works out. All of them were disappointments. Now, look, some kings did some good things, but compared to Yahweh as their king, they were all disappointments. Every one of the kings that they had compared to God as their king was a disappointment Yeah. until about a thousand years later. And a thousand years later, it's Passover. There are millions of Jews gathered at Pentecost. There's a loud trumpet, the shout of an archangel straight out of heaven mm -hmm. on a chariot burning with fire. Yep. An escort of 10,000 angels and trumpets. Mm -hmm. The Lord Jesus descent. Is that how it happened? Nope. No, that's not how it happened. Um, but a king did come, a real king. But he didn't come to millions of people with, you know, angel-escorted golden fiery chariots. He yep. came to a, a child, as a child, born mm -hmm. to a poor family yep. in a small town yep. in the animals' quarters. Mm -hmm. He was not the king anyone was looking for. He was not the king the world wanted. He wasn't the king Israel wanted, but he was the king that Israel needed. I mean, look, if we're just putting some things together here— mm -hmm. He's the king they rejected. That's right. All those years ago. He is. He's the king he's, they rejected. Yeah. <laughs> he's That's right. God with us. God in the flesh. Yeah. Emmanuel. Yeah. Who is that? Yeah. Jesus. He, he's the, he's the, the king has arrived is more like it. The one they rejected. The, the, first the real eight. king, not their imposter king, mm -hmm. their puppet king, their mm -hmm. whatever king. Mm -hmm. The real king is here now and they rejected him again. Mm -hmm. All those earthly kings in many cases led him into bondage by the way that they led. And when Jesus came, he comes into town on a donkey and he goes to a scourging. He goes to the cross. And all they wanted with a, the with a king in the Old Testament was to set him free. Yep. They wanted to <clears throat> rule. And Jesus ends up being the only king. He didn't, he didn't want the king they were expecting and wanting. They want an earthly king. And Jesus said, no, my kingdom's not of this world, John 18, 36. But he was the only king that could ever set them free. And he's the only king that can ever set you free. And so the question for everybody watching, I guess, to close out is who's your king? Is Jesus your king? Um, are you serving him? If you're not a Christian, he's not your king. Um, how do you become a subject of a king? Let's say that you, I don't know, move into his kingdom and you want to be, well, him, you submit to him. Yeah, number one, you're going to have to submit to him. You're going yeah. to have to present yourself to the king and swear your loyalty to the king or whatever that country may require of you. Our king has certain things that he requires. That's right. If you, if you want to be a subject to a king, you know, let's say Alexander the Great, you do what he tells you to do. Yeah. That's what a king does, what yep. he wants to do. And so he has Good a to be kingdom. King, as that's a, right. That you want, you want to be a member that. of a king's rule, his kingdom. That's what kingdom means. So there's a king that rules a kingdom. Yep. And so God has a kingdom. His dominion. Colossians 1.13 talks about they've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, which is Jesus. Mm -hmm. So how do you become a member of that kingdom? How do you make Jesus your king? You submit to his terms, which are belief, John 8, 24, John 3.16, Repentance, Acts 17, 30, Acts 2, 38, confession, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And you're baptized by the king's authority, Acts 22, 16, Acts 2, 38, et cetera, et cetera. And then you live by the king's law. That's right. right. And maybe you've made Jesus your king in the past, but you've been rebellious in your life. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've been a seditionist, right? You know, but we got a good king. He'll forgive you. We got a good king. He'll forgive you if you just do what he said, which is repent and pray. Yep. Even if you break his law, he'll still forgive you as long as you're willing to ask him and be humble about it and come back. That's right. So are we going to be like the people in 1 Samuel 8 who have God as our king and say, nah, we want someone else? Yeah. Or are we going to be happy with God as our king and that's our choice. live to serve him? Got two choices. Yeah, that's right. Two choices. Really? Boil it all down. Yeah. And the question is, what choice will we make? And what uh, choice will you make? And you too, Washington, <laughs> and everybody else. What choice will we make? Who's going to be our king? Thanks for hanging out with us on this episode of The Authentic Christian Podcast. We hope that you'll make Jesus your king as we will strive to do that on our own as well. And we hope to see you back on the next episode. Hope you have a great day.
Hey everybody, thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network, or GBN for short. You can hop on the App Store, search Gospel Broadcasting Network, and you can download the app. And there's this show, many other great shows that you can watch or listen to and start learning more about the Bible and uh, why we're here, what our purpose is. Thanks for listening.